managing water efficiency. Uh, so it's she has a consulting business for this. Uh, <clears throat> two uh, new uh, people, Donna Haraway and Susan Harding, are also welcomed. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that should bring our uh, membership to 162, uh, which is two above uh, my goal for the year, which was to <laughs> add 10 people. <clears throat> but the year's not over, so bring your friends that are not members, and uh, w the capacity of the room is 80, so we have more space to allow that. <clears throat> Uh, we have 66 lifetime members and five lifetime associate members. 57% uh, and rising of all living emeriti of UCSC are members of this organization. <clears throat> uh, I want to announce a special event, potentially, uh, and that is the provost of Crown College invited us to have an event there. And I chose a month that we don't normally meet in, such as February, <clears throat> and uh, that will be February 9th uh, for lunch on a Saturday at 11 o'clock or 11.30. We haven't worked out the exact logistics because there's gonna be shuttles to take you from the parking lot to uh, the meeting place. And for those going on to Daziki Memorial uh, in the afternoon, uh, the shuttle will take you from this event uh, to there. The other news uh, for the luncheon is that uh, there will be no charge. <clears throat> Free lunch. <laughs> and the, the, the other interesting thing about it is we we hear from Emeriti at Emeriti Lectures, we hear from uh, faculty, working faculty at our luncheons. The, the group that we, haven't, we never hear from, uh, at least in this venue, is the students. And so I thought, well, if we want to listen to the students, we have to go where the students are. And that's why we're meeting at Crown, besides the fact we got invited. <coughs> And uh, the presentations will be about the programs that are going on there, student projects, uh, something called social fiction. Uh, they have a conference about this. So the purpose is to learn what all of these things are and to find out uh, what students are doing. This is the 50th year for Crown College and uh, it, it sh promises to be an interesting program. <clears throat> I'd like a show of hands for how many people would like to go to this special meeting February 9th, Saturday afternoon for lunch uh, with a program that, that brings us in contact with students, hear their viewpoint. Okay, about 25, and that's just of this group. Um, this is the largest audience we've had uh, at any luncheon in 40 years, so <clears throat> congratulate you. Um, the other exciting things on the horizon is, of course, newsletter uh, 1-3 coming out 31st of January. Look for that. Uh, you'll get it in your email, <clears throat> and it will be available on the website. Uh, the survey data that you, the survey you took, we're working on that. I just got the full data set last night. So uh, the only result I have so far is what I got from the, uh, re <clears throat> the Office of Research, and that is that... Uh, Emeriti 
at Santa Cruz brought seventeen million twenty six dollars and eight hundred and twenty six thousand eight hundred and eighty five. Seventeen million from the outside world brought into Santa Cruz. And we're working on what the donations to the campus uh, were, and we'll get that from University Relations. So I, we had the highest participation of any uh, UC campus, 53.2%. Uh, 148 people uh, replied. We have 150, at that time we had 150 members, so uh, the person that ran this, John Bowes at, from Davis, uh, was very pleased and impressed. So with that, I'd like to have uh, Jim Gill come up and announce, uh, introduce the speaker for today. Thank you. <coughs> so this large attendance is here, I'm sure, to hear Andy Fisher. Andy came to Santa Cruz uh, in 1995, having spent the preceding four years or so working for something called the Ocean Drilling Program, which is an international consortium to study rocks on the seafloor. In that capacity, he met Casey Moore and Shirley Dreiss, who were responsible for persuading him to come here after Shirley's death. After, like most of our speakers, Andy has a, um, uh, the usual uh, combination of uh, teaching, research, and service. Uh, as a result of that, last year he was elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, something that's restricted to not 0.1% of the profession. And he's here today to talk about a timely topic uh, at a time of a lot of rainfall, namely the recharge of water to the ground. <coughs> uh, for about 20 years or so, he's led, he created and led this thing, the Recharge Institute there at the bottom right, which is a very ambitious combination of uh, field instrumentation, laboratory studies, analytical chemistry, data <coughs> visualization, and sophisticated numerical models of how water moves in the subsurface. But in addition to that, it involves a public outreach component, a buy-in with uh, multiple stakeholders, government agencies, landowners, farmers, and he does more than lecture to them. He engages them in genuine conversation that affects the design of his research. Uh, some of you may also know his wife, Carrie Pomeroy, who is a uh, university extension specialist who works on the fishing communities and managing of fisheries in the Central Coast. So both of them are at that interface of their research lives and the public. There's three things that I want to tell you about him uh, before he speaks. One is that his research is unusually amphibious. <laughs> that is, he could as easily have talked to us, interestingly, about his work on the seafloor, where he builds instrumentation, deploys it to study uh, how water moves in below the ocean instead of in the ocean. It's, what you'll hear, in my mind, is also uh, risk-taking. Uh, as you listen to his talk, Think about whether you would have had the guts to start a program like this at the cusp of tenure and move away from what you did your PhD in. And last, it's um, a topic that's very important to our daily life and the economy that we live in here in the Central California coast given our dependence on water under the ground, especially in time of drought. So with that, the floor is yours, Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I wonder if we could get the lights off in the, in the back there, because it'll make the slides a little bit easier to see. <clears throat> oh, that's great. Well, thanks very much. It really is an honor to be here and to get to talk to you, my colleagues, my friends, um, I'll be joining you soon. 
<laughs> um, it's exciting to be here, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about that. I gave a presentation in the fall to um, the Lifelong Learners group, and this talk today is going to be different because I'm really going to focus more on uh, chemistry and microbiology today, and I'll bring you along. I'm going to show you some data. We'll talk about projects and stakeholders and addressing some of California's big water problems, but I also want to uh, feature some of the exciting scientific work, interdisciplinary work that we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, my co-authors on this presentation include quite a large group, and this is really a subgroup, and uh, many of these are former uh, students and postdocs who have moved on to other institutions. They're now postdocs or faculty or a lieutenant commander in the Coast Guard, uh, various other um, activities, and it's exciting to be at a place in a time where we can pull together all different kinds of, of work in different communities to tell stories like I'll tell you today. <clears throat> so the topic for today is groundwater recharge. And this is the movement of surface water into the ground to become groundwater. And it's shown as a cartoon here, lots of different kinds of recharge. Water flowing in through streams, flowing through farm fields, wetlands, and these specialized recharge basins. We'll talk about these a little bit um, today. Now, I want to give you a couple of definitions so we're all on the same page. Groundwater is water that exists below the ground. Um, some people imagine that groundwater below the ground is in giant caves. When I was a little kid and I first heard about groundwater, having grown up on Johnny Quest on Saturday mornings, I naturally thought about enormous caves with cataracts of white water frothing through them and the fins of enormous sharks cutting through the water. <laughs> and sadly, that rarely happens. Um, here on our campus, we actually do have un underground rivers and caves, but it's relatively rare. Most groundwater is just in the little cracks and spaces between little bits of sediment. And you can't see it, and it makes it kind of cryptic and mysterious. Um, an aquifer is an underground unit that can store and transmit water in usable quantities. It's a very utilitarian uh, concept. There are some shallow aquifers that are accessible right away to the surface, and others that are confined beneath clay or other layers. And they're even more mysterious because we really, in many cases, don't know where their boundaries are. We don't know how much water they hold. And indeed, within California, there's a lot of debate over exactly how much water is actually in the ground. And then finally, there's this thing called overdraft. And that's where the amount of water that's pumped, in addition to all of the other outflows that may occur naturally or for other reasons, exceeds the capacity of the system to deliver that water. And when that happens, you get all kinds of undesirable consequences. And along the coast, we get seawater intrusion. And in other places, the ground sinks. These are actually recent photos that the USGS put out for the Central Valley, showing where the ground was in 65 and then where the ground was in 16. Here's 1988. There it is in 2016. Um, the ground sinks because so much water is taken out that it causes many of the clay units that are sort of embedded within the aquifers to collapse. And that's essentially permanent loss of storage. That space never comes back, not in a human lifetime and, and not for very, very long geological time. So it's really problematic because we're not only losing that water that's been, that's been mined essentially from the ground, but we've removed the capacity of those systems to store water in the future. So this is a big problem. It's kind of a slow motion train wreck affecting the entire state. But every aquifer and every region is a little bit different. Like Tip O'Neill said about politics, all groundwater is local. <laughs> so, so what about groundwater recharge? Well, it does occur naturally as well as artificially, although the natural part is really cryptic. If you had to do a budget for an aquifer, this would be the largest inflow. But it's almost impossible to measure. It's the only major hydrologic flow that we can't measure from space. And it can have a big impact on water quality. That's going to be the focus of our, of our presentation today. And of course, it's heavily influenced by the way that we use our landscapes. And it's heavily influenced by changes to our climate, including those that we're causing through other activities. So when we talk about water, what do we talk about? Well, I like to say we talk about a pizza box. Imagine a 200 by 200 foot pizza, one foot thick. That's an acre foot. It's a nice round unit. Okay, an acre foot of water. If you have a 10 acre field and you need a foot of water, you need 10 acre feet. Isn't that easy? So we like to talk about water in, in acre feet because <laughs> if you talk about millions of gallons, I don't even know what that means. All right, and another way to think about it is one acre foot is enough water for two families for a year, okay? <clears throat> the other thing we talk about when we talk about water is water years. A water year starts October 1st. 
and then it runs to September 30th of the next year. And the reason we do that is because that way we're not dividing up a water year right in the middle of the wet season, right? So we start the year in October and then we run it through September. So right now we're in the 2019 water year and it started October 1st of last year. So you'll see us talking about water years later on. So California really faces a triple threat with regards to groundwater. One big factor, of course, is the increasing demand. But the other two are changes to land use, paving and manipulating the landscape, which tends to limit infiltration, and then changes to our climate. And one thing we're seeing is that the mean annual precipitation hasn't changed very much, but more rain is falling during a shorter number of more intense events. And when we have more intense rainfall, there's less opportunity for that water to infiltrate into the ground and then recharge the underlying aquifers. So all of these factors are having a big effect on our, on our groundwater. Um, very briefly, how bad is it? Um, well, when I arrived in 95, these were estimates from the Department of Water Resources as to the size of the annual deficit. These are millions of acre feet, it's cut off. So the dry year deficit, they said, was five million acre feet. That's enough water for 10 million families, to put it in perspective. And they projected at the time, by 2020, this would be cut in half and the normal year deficit would be driven down to zero. At the same time as our population was growing by 50%, right? The equivalent of the next nearest eight states picking up and moving to California, we were all gonna use less water, right? Well, now we're living in the future, right? It's almost 2020, so the things must be a lot better. <laughs> so it's worse. And, and these estimates are before the drought. This is data from before the drought. So we are overdrafting aquifers at a huge rate. We're pulling much more water out of the ground than is, than is going back in. And you can do that for a while, just like you can draw down a trust fund for a while. But at some point, you simply won't have the reservoir storage to accommodate all of that extraction. So that's really our, that's really our, our challenge. Now there's also a big effect on water quality. The diagram on the left shows some monitoring wells and they're color coded, the red and the orange have had their water levels decrease by 10 feet or more. Um, the diagram on the right shows monitoring of water quality, and in particular, we've got a contaminant known as nitrate, this NO3. You're going to see that again. Nitrate is commonly deposited because of industrial activity, it comes out of the atmosphere, but the big effect is from application of nitrogen to the ground as a fertilizer, which helps crops to grow. And the application of nitrogen has, has really skyrocketed since the Green Revolution. And many of the crops that are grown now in California, which are very high value, are also nitrate intensive. And so we apply a lot of nitrogen to the landscape. The plants don't use all of it, and a lot of it ends up in groundwater. Anything that is red exceeds the drinking water standard for nitrate. It can make people ill, especially kids. And anything in yellow is, is impaired damage beyond what would be naturally occurring. So many, many wells in California are not only having lower water levels, but they're showing increases in nitrate contamination. These two problems really go together. Now, this part of the state, the Central Coast region, where we are now, it's unique in California because we don't use more water than anybody else, but we get a larger fraction of our fresh water from the ground than any other part of the state. In fact, the city of Santa Cruz is kind of unusual. We're the only community around Monterey Bay that relies mainly on surface water. Everybody else is 80, 90, 100% dependent on groundwater. So this is a challenge for us, but it also creates a lot of opportunities because we're off the grid in terms of statewide water transfers. We don't get any water from the Central Valley, from the State Water Project or the Central Valley Project. And so we don't have any choice. We have to deal with this issue of the imbalance. I'd argue in the long run, the rest of the state is in exactly the same position. It's just not apparent yet because by shuttling a lot of water around, you're able to kind of paper over the problem. But statewide, the issues we're grappling with here are the same problems the rest of the state is grappling with or will be grappling with going forward. So as Jim mentioned, about 10 years ago or so, I was thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I thought, well, I want to leave behind a legacy of some solutions to these groundwater issues. And, and it was at a time when groundwater recharge wasn't sort of a hot topic in, in many ways. And so in a way, the field was kind of open. There were a lot of questions and not that many people working on the problems. So we put together a program, me and some colleagues, where we were going to have really four main areas, mapping where recharge could occur, modeling the availability of water and how it gets in the ground, then building projects to improve supplies and improve quality. 
After that, we added another program to try to monetize these activities, to create incentives. So people would do projects that would help to improve water resources. I can't talk about all of this today, so in the remaining time, I'm really going to focus on the water quality part, because we've had some exciting results in the last few years. But I'm happy to answer questions about the other bits. And I'll, I'll just note, I left a handout up front about the Recharge Initiative. If you'd like more information, there's a little information there. I've got cards. And I'm happy to give you links to papers and show, give you other PowerPoints and tell you about other, other projects. All right, so there's lots of ways to get water in the ground. And the way we're going to focus on is finding the best places to put that water in, having a dedicated infiltration basin, and getting excess surface water to the basin when you can, and then allowing it to infiltrate so you can recover it. And here's a project we've been working on for some years. This is the Harkin Slough Managed Aquifer Recharge Project, or MAR. You'll see that acronym later on in the talk. And this was developed in the early 2000s by the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. And we started working there in 2003, first to test some of our equipment, and then later to do research. And we put out instruments here. They fill this thing up with wetland water when, it, when the water quality is good and there's enough flow in the nearby Harkin Slough. And it's about a seven acre basin. It's kind of hard to see. It's surrounded by active fields where they grow berries and vegetables and, and other crops. And then they let that water soak in the ground, recover it later, distribute it in a blend with other water to local growers whose wells are salted up and they can't get their own groundwater to grow their crops. So they use this water and, and other water. Now, that process of getting the water in the ground is more complicated than you might think. Here's the basin, and here's kind of a cartoon through the basin. When the water goes in, we see a mound in the underlying groundwater, but if you zoom in on this part, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of an upside down aquifer. There's a water table at the bottom, and this area is saturated. That means all the pores are filled. And then the water moves downward, and the depth of that inverted water table is a function of the rate of inflow and then the rate of drainage from the base. So these systems are kind of like little windows where we can do experiments and understand how recharge works in general. It just so happens to be a place where we can instrument and sample and understand these processes more broadly. One part of our work has involved looking around Santa Cruz and northern Monterey County and figuring out where to put new projects, where would be the right conditions. So one project we put together collected all different kinds of data in a computer mapping program and then created maps like this. The areas that are in green are more suitable for recharge and the areas in pink are less suitable. If we look just at southern Santa Cruz and northern Monterey, this is the Pajaro Valley, the drainage area under which is the Pajaro Valley groundwater basin. And in there, about 40% of the area has good or great conditions for infiltrating water to make recharge, the green spots that are sort of scattered all over here. This map and others like it are posted at the Resource Conservation District website, and they're being used by water agencies and stakeholders all around the area to try to plan and develop new projects. In addition, we've done computer models to try to figure out where runoff occurs when there are big storm events. And we used the US Geological Survey model, which is shown schematically here, to, in our computer, apply water to the landscape under different conditions, and then see how much soaks in and how much runs off. Where are the opportunities to collect that excess surface water? And here are some of the maps we generated. This shows rainfall under dry, normal, and wet conditions um, based on historic data. And then the map on the bottom shows where runoff will occur, where you'd get a lot of water moving across the landscape. The areas in green have more runoff and the areas in pink have less. So if you know where the runoff is going to occur, then you could potentially gather that water, find a spot where it could go in the ground, and start building projects. This data also is available for the community, and it's online and, and being actively used. One of the projects that we've been working on is located here in the back of the Pajaro Valley Basin. This is the Pajaro River. The city of Watsonville is located right here. This is a drainage area of about 120 acres on a working ranch, and there's about a four acre basin here. Water gets routed when it runs off the landscape through a ditch and through a culvert and into that basin. And the goal here is to get about 100 acre feet per year into the ground. And we've mostly been successful, although during the drought, it was pretty hard to get water to flow into the ground. So we have um, that project is at Boca Risa Ranch. We actually have four others that are in some stages. The one at Stores is running now. We have one we put in last year at the Watsonville Airport. Airports generate a lot of runoff, it turns out. And that may be an opportunity that we're, that we're missing out on. 
And we have another one in process. It's been funded, and we've been uh, struggling with some of the permitting with our partners at the RCD, but that should go in this spring and summer, and we have other sites that we're looking at. So what part of our goal is to build these projects and then figure out how they work and use that information to build better projects and help the community to do more of this, this kind of work. All right, but one of the big questions is, if you're gonna use stormwater, stormwater is not always drinking water, right? The water quality can be kind of spotty, especially that first flush, when the first rainfall event of the year occurs. But even later, if water is running off of working landscapes and you're picking up contaminants from farms or from roads or from housing, what are we gonna do about that? So there's really two ways that managed recharge can improve water quality. One is just by dilution, and the other is by reactions. So I wanna talk a little bit about both of those. Um, just to put this in perspective, this is a map that shows groundwater contamination by nitrate in the Pajaro Valley. So this was produced by the Water Agency, and it shows about a 10 year period, and these are average nitrate concentrations, and anything in dark green is at or above the maximum contaminant level that you're allowed for drinking water. So you can see there's a lot of areas where you've got these dark green splotches, and that's where the groundwater is pretty poor quality already. So this is one thing to keep in mind. Some of the runoff we put in the ground may not be drinking water, but as long as it's better than this, we're moving things in the right direction. And this is actually something that I think we need to think about more carefully around the state. We may not be putting in the best water all the time, but as a first step, when you're dealing with contamination like this, I think any water that's better is a move in the right direction and we shouldn't miss out on those opportunities. This is Kala Schmidt, former grad student. She's now a professor at University of San Francisco. She did a study here at the Harkin Slough Project where we went out when the basin was dry and we put in all kinds of instruments. We put in probes to measure the flow rate and we put in samplers to get water at different depths below the ground. And we ran these tubes out and then we'd have these little um, posts here near the edge of the basin. And either during rainstorms, Kala would come out in the middle of the rain with a big tent or on a beautiful day like this with a pump and a filter and we'd collect water samples and then analyze them to figure out as that water soaked in, what happened to it? Was the water going in the ground the same as the water that penetrated through the ground after it went down a half a meter or a meter? Okay, so again, the water's soaking in here and we're gonna zoom in on this uppermost part. We're looking at this part of the infiltration system. We'll also look at the deeper groundwater a little bit. Okay, so here's 90 days of data that Cala collected. And this is from when they started to operate that managed recharge system. It was in January when they start diverting the water. And so this is the days of MAR, the days of managed aquifer recharge. This started in January of 2008. The white curve shows the nitrate concentrations of the water coming in, and these colorful curves show the nitrate concentrations along these profiles at half meter to one meter depth below the bottom of the basin. So you could see a couple of things. First, the water quality wasn't fantastic early in the season, not unusual. That first pulse of water coming off the landscape is often loaded with salts and nitrates and other contaminants. But then it cleaned up pretty well. But the other thing is that all the subsurface water is better than the surface water after it's soaked in about a meter or a meter and a half. And this continues all the way through the infiltration season. If you take this difference in chemistry and you multiply by the flow rate, we can calculate the change in load, the change in the amount of nitrate being delivered to the underlying aquifer. The amount added to the basin is shown here, but the load reduction is shown here. It's about 50%. So something on the order of 600 kilograms of nitrate nitrogen was actually being removed from that water as it moved through the soil. What's going on? We'll get back to that. Let me show you one other thing. Here's a record from the basin and two monitoring wells located to the south of the basin, one in blue and one in green. Those curves are shown here. This is a year of data and the area in, in gray is when the system was operating. And you can see the water levels going up, the mound being formed. What's interesting is it takes about three weeks for that mound to form. And indeed, if you calculate based on the flow rates, it ought to take three weeks for the water to reach the water table below. But in fact, at this monitoring well too, we see the first arrival of clean water within about two days, very quickly. That indicates there's a lot of variability in how the water moves through the soil. It doesn't move down evenly like a plug. There are little fingers where the water moves very quickly. 
So we need to be able to improve water quality when it moves very quickly through the soil, not just slowly. So this is a dilution effect, but some of the benefit, the improvement, is a consequence of reaction in the sediment. How does that reaction occur? Well, boy, the nitrogen cycle is complicated. There are people who spend their whole careers working on how different forms of nitrogen change in the air, in the water, and in the ground. Here's nitrate. This is the contaminant. And it can do a lot of things. It can become ammonium. It can become nitrite and nitrous oxide. But what we really want is the nitrate to become nitrogen gas like we breathe in the air. It's essentially inert, and it's virtually a permanent removal from the aquatic system. And the process by which nitrite, nitrate rather, is converted to nitrogen gas, that's called denitrification. That's the process we'd like to see occurring. So when does that occur? Well, you typically need low oxygen, lots of nitrate, and lots of carbon. Those are the things that are needed because this process is facilitated by microbes. The microbes that live in the soil live in the bottom of streams, maybe live in some aquifers. When they use up the oxygen, many of them can switch their function, and they'll then use the nitrate as a source of oxygen. So they'll oxidize carbon to do their business, to build their bodies, and in doing so, they will reduce the nitrate, and they'll turn it into this inert gas, which we don't mind being added to the atmosphere. It's not a greenhouse gas. Right? 78% of what we breathe is this. It's fine. So we'd like to figure out if this is going on in this system. One way we can tell is by measuring the isotopes of the oxygen and the nitrogen in the nitrate. Now, the isotopes, these are, these are elements that have different numbers of neutrons. And it turns out that the microbes that live in the soil, if they have a choice, they tend to eat the lighter weight isotope and they leave the heavier stuff behind. So when the microbes consume that nitrate, when they practice denitrification, you can see an enrichment of what's left behind, what we call the residual. And if you plot the delta 18O and delta 15N, these are the, the heavier isotopes of nitrate, if you plot them against each other, then what starts here should go that way if denitrification is occurring. And indeed, in this system, we have the smoking gun for denitrification. We see that the isotopes of the remaining nitrate get heavier. We have other data that tells us this denitrification is really what's occurring here, but, but this is really one of the strongest signals. Now, here's something else that we calculated. We measured the infiltration rate, and then we calculated the rate of denitrification, and much of the data plots along this monotonic relationship here up until we hit about 0.8 meters a day. In other words, as long as the infiltration rate is less than about 0.8 meters a day, not only will the microbes consume the nitrate, they'll do it faster. They're actually being stimulated. As we deliver this water to them faster, they will do their business faster. It's like you're at the sushi boat, and they run the boats past you faster so you eat more sushi, right? <laughs> so the bugs are doing the same thing. They're in the soil. If we can deliver the water, the nitrate, and the carbon, it turns out in this water, it comes out of a wetland that's rich in carbon. So that's what we need in order to make the microbes who are already present in the soil, they're everywhere, right? Give them a chance to do what they do best, and that's remove this contaminant on their own without us having to do anything else. <clears throat> All right, so we had an idea a couple years ago. In the literature, uh, people have tried to, get to uh, remediate groundwater with something called a permeable reactive barrier, or PRB and they'll dig a trench and they'll put a wall in and then fill that wall with a reactive material. Depending on what contaminant you want to remove, you'd put different materials in the wall. And this could be anything from iron filings or very reactive metallic materials for certain kinds of organic contamination to simple wood chips. And in some studies, those wood chips have been shown to denitrify for 10 years or more. So this seemed kind of interesting and we wondered, well, could you put a permeable reactive barrier in the bottom of a recharge basin. Why don't we just turn that on its side by 90 degrees and let's see what happens. So we started to do a series of experiments and I'm just gonna show you a couple of results from that, but they're promising. So what we did is we set up these experimental plots one meter by one meter. And if you look in cross section, here's what you'd see. A boatload of instruments put down here, samplers, flow meters, we put a float switch on the side so that we can run this thing for two weeks or more and we don't have to be there 
24 hours a day. It'll run all by itself because when the float goes up, the water turns on, and then when, sorry, when the float goes up, the water turns off, and then the plot drains, and the float goes down, and it turns it back on. And just because nothing is as exciting as watching a little movie. Right? Here's a time lapse. Here's a time lapse picture showing the thing operating. This is one photo every minute. Okay, so it kind of looks like a toilet bowl, right? You've got your little float switch right here. And this is two weeks of data. And if you blow up one day, you get this little sawtooth pattern. And every rise and fall is a little test. Every rise and fall is a test. So we run these systems in different kinds of soils, and then we collect fluid samples from the bottom, and we see if adding a layer of some material improves the water quality. We've tried several different kinds of wood chips, and we've also used something called biochar, which is a highly refined form of charcoal. I'm just going to show you results from the wood chips. Um, this is native soil. Here's the concentration of nitrate and dissolved carbon. And not much change. A little bit of removal of nitrate as you go down. Here's the wood chips. We see a big increase in carbon being delivered to the soil. It's a carbon source. And those bugs get really excited and they start to consume the nitrate. And we've actually, this is actually a, a relatively modest improvement. It was in very sandy soils. We see up to an 80% load reduction. Um, under slower flow rates. So let's combine the two data sets. Here's Cala's data from Harkin Slough with native soil. And we do get an improvement up to about 0.8 meters a year. When we add the wood chips, we can actually get an improvement up to two, sorry, uh, uh, 0.8 meters a day, a day. When we add the wood chips, we can kick that up to two meters a day. We can more than double the flow rate at which the microbes are able to consume the nitrate. Okay, by giving them more carbon, reducing the oxygen, we can stimulate them. And this is using something that's essentially a waste product. And when you add that up, if you look at Cala's data again, there's a whole section of data here in the dark green where we would get denitrification that wouldn't have occurred without the wood chips. And if you do the math, you pretty much double the nitrate removal. Right? So all we need to do is disk in some wood on the bottom of these basins, and we can probably do a heck of a lot of cleanup before that water gets in and contributes to contamination of the underlying aquifer. Okay, one question we got many years ago with Cala's work was which microbes are there? Can you prove that you've really got microbes in the soil that are doing this? So we started working with Chad Saltikoff in, in microbiology and environmental toxicology. And in Sarah Boganskis' work, we did microbial sampling before and after the experiment. And we analyzed the 16S DNA to see whether there were microbes present who are denitrifiers. So these are data from before, both with native soil and with the permeable reactive barrier. And they're essentially the same. The, 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 the symbols here look the same. Each symbol represents what's called an operational taxonomic unit, or OTU. It's a group of microbes. It could be as specific as a species, but usually it's a family or an order. It's a group of microbes. And the ones that are marked with the symbols are part of the, nitrate, uh, the nitrogen cycle. Okay. So the soils began the same. And after we infiltrated through native soil, we saw statistically no change. But when we, when we infiltrated through the wood chips and the nitrate was removed, we saw a huge shift towards these nitrogen cyclers. We have additional work underway using the RNA, which is the actual signal. And that's to see who's active. Okay, so we're still working on this with Chad and his group, but we've certainly found strong evidence that indeed we've had a shift in the microbial community, all of which were present before we started. We are not introducing new bugs. They're already there, just waiting for their day to shine. All right, waiting for us to give them the conditions where they can do our business for us by removing that nitrate. Yeah? I, I sort of lost track. Why is it so important to get rid of this nitrate? Well, it's a contaminant. It's very unhealthy. It's unhealthy for people and for aquatic systems. So it's harmful to drink it, I mean, and it's harmful to have it in our rivers and our coastal waters. It's natural water. It's, it's harmful? It's harmful to have nitrate in your water. Absolutely. It leads in, in, in small kids, it leads to something known as methanoglobinemia, or blue baby syndrome where they're not getting enough, the nitrate takes the place of oxygen in the bloodstream, they don't get oxygen to the brain, they can suffer brain damage. But it's also teratogenic, it can lead to birth defects for pregnant women. There's a lot of problems with nitrate. And of course it affects especially communities of color and other disadvantaged groups because they don't have a choice in many cases. So nitrate's a huge issue around California and around the world. 
Let me, if it's okay, let me move on. And we should have some time here because we're, we're doing pretty well. And I can answer the, the rest of your questions. So we've been doing other work lately in the last couple of years. Um, one of my students was really excited about doing controlled tests in the lab. When we go in the field and we do these percolation experiments, we can't actually control the flow rate. Different soils give us different rates and you kind of get what you get. But we wanted to understand how the flow rate influences the ability to remove the nitrate. So to figure that out, we built a custom coring system, right? And we brought it out in the field and we hammer core this thing into the ground and we couldn't resist, so. <laughs> Yeah. So there we are, and we use a slide hammer system to push this thing in the ground, and Kyle's there keeping it level, and then we built this truck jack system to get it out, okay, because once you've, once you've hammered the heck out of it a meter into the ground, it's pretty hard to remove, so we built a, we have what's called a pipe dog, and then two truck jacks, and we built a mount for it, and so we jack the thing out, and then we bring it into the lab, we flip it upside down, we apply a PRB to the bottom, and then we can push water through at whatever rate we want. We can push it fast, we can push it slow, and it's an intact core. So we're preserving the microbial communities. We're not remolding the material, which is the common approach. Okay. So we're doing those experiments, and we've actually found very similar results and, and even better results in some cases by slowing the water down a little. What this means is we may want to design these recharge systems so we don't necessarily get as much water as possible. We might want to find that sweet spot where we get some water to improve the quantity but we also improved the quality to reach our optimal targets. The other thing we did last year that was pretty exciting was we instrumented 3,000 square meters in an active MAR system. This is one of the basins that you saw earlier. It's a panoramic picture, so it's kind of distorted. All right, that area of wood chips is shown right here, and this was in, in, in um, December last year, and there's Araceli Serrano, one of my PhD students, and she's out there in the middle of a rainstorm sampling. They were actually out yesterday as well. Uh, collecting water samples, and we'll collect more samples during the year. So we don't have that data yet. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, we got invited to get involved in a project uh, in the Central Valley, which we're pretty excited about. And this is a 400-acre winery. We visited in September to check the site out, and then we were out there together with some folks from Davis and, and Merced and the Kasumnas, um, uh Coalition, which is an NGO that brings together ranchers and and naturalists and others who are concerned about water quality. And we put out instruments in this, in this field and we're monitoring right now because they're planning to actually flood uh, 400 acres with flows from the Kasumnas River, what's called flood mar. And one idea for California is to flood hundreds of thousands of acres of the Central Valley in order to get more water in the ground. But we have no idea of what impact that's gonna have on water quality, especially if there are legacy pools of nitrate in the soil left over from decades of farming. It may be that by manipulating the conditions, maybe with wood chips or other materials, we can create the conditions to get rid of that legacy pool. We don't know. We don't know. This is the beginning. But we're excited to be out there. This year, we're just going to monitor the flow rate. But hopefully, by next year, we'll be working there to monitor water quality as well. So to wrap up, um, stormwater, which is something that's heretofore been considered a nuisance, right? We get we route stormwater off the landscape as quick as we can. It's being increasingly viewed in California and much of the Western US and, and other parts of the world as a, as a resource. Um, I think we need to find the best places where we can put this water in the ground. Um, and the best places might be where the physical conditions are optimal, but they may also be where the chemical conditions will allow us to manage water quality. Um, we can definitely do that, but it's going to take more work. We need to build the systems, and we have to build them to measure, and then be there in order to make those measurements when events are occurring, like these rainstorms. Uh, groundwater recharge um, is a hydrologic system service. It provides a lot of benefits, and incentivizing this is pretty important. I didn't talk about it today, but we've been working on a program as well to try to compensate landowners for the loss of the use of their land when we do projects like these. And I think that's an important part of the, of the puzzle as well. Uh, managed recharge with stormwater is not going to solve California's water problem, but it can be a piece of the solution. And I think we're going to need to find a whole portfolio of solutions if we're going to address this. We've, we've taken 100 years to get ourselves into this situation, and it's going to take decades or hundreds of years to get out of it. But we need to keep chipping away at the problem, and this shows one set of approaches that might be uh, particularly helpful. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. 
Joe Gurney had, had one a while back and I put them off. So let me start there. Why wood chips? Yeah, yeah great question. So um, wood chips are a good source of carbon. Um, the microbes don't just need any carbon. In fact, it turns out when we give them carbon from biochar, this charcoal, uh, it doesn't help them all that much. Um, they like living in the charcoal because it's got lots of little nooks and crannies, but the kind of carbon they get there is, is um, pyrolyzed, it's cooked. And the stuff that's easy for them to work with biologically is gone. It's been burned off. Have you varied the, the types of wood chips? Uh, yeah, we're working on it. We've tried a couple of kinds of wood. In, in um, the initial studies, we use redwood because it's widely available around here, and it's well known as a garden amendment, as a denitrifier. Um, and it seems to work really, really well. Um, in the project that I showed at the Boca Riza site, where we have 3,000 square meters of wood, we're using willows because that's what was available on the site. Um, there's a whole career or many careers, many PhDs that could be done on lots of different factors. There's a lot of variables. But the fact is, folks haven't been thinking about how to treat the water as it goes in the ground as part of recharge, right? So now, I think what we've done is show the way forward, and it's more than we can do. Lots of people should be doing these experiments, and more people are. There are people, other folks, looking into these kinds of studies. And I think we need to understand also how the benefits vary, say, based on the kind of soil. California soils, especially in the coastal regions, are really variable. Sandier, clayier, more organic, less organic. There are different depths of different soils. I mean, there's a lot of variables here. So it's too simple to say this is the one way to do it and everybody should do it this way. I think every basin is going to have to explore these issues on their own. Our goal here is to try to develop these methods, get things standardized, and show the high quality peer reviewed data that you need in order to start making decisions and applying these ideas on a broader scale. And then every one of those implementation projects is a dissertation. Every one is a senior <laughs> thesis, right? This is a great role for the university because we have the time. We can put the time in, okay? And other agencies, water agencies, they can't do research. You know, and, and other groups like the USGS, they can do some, but they got to raise the money too, and they can't afford to put decades in like faculty can. So I'm serious. We are in a really unique position to provide a tremendous service for the state while we're sorting out some of these fundamental questions about how the world works. So I think it's a really great opportunity for the university, for us and for, and for others. Yes, please. If you change the microbial mix by uh, using wood chips as you flood actual farmland, does that affect the fertility of the land? Yeah, great question. It's probably going to improve the landscape. Um, you know, we're adding organic carbon. And, and also, as part of the process, you're going to disc these materials in. And so typically, that's what growers do anyway between seasons to break up the soil and open up those pores. Um, but it's a good question. And there may be other ancillary impacts that we simply don't know about. There are often unintended consequences. My guess is the net change is going to be positive but there's probably other effects that are taking place that we don't even know about because we haven't tried to measure them yet. Actually, two of my other students, Araceli and Jenny Penske, are also looking at metals contamination. That's one of the other big problems in California are trace metals, things like arsenic and uranium. And we're also looking at those to see how leaching from the soil could be either increased, hopefully not, or decreased through these additions. Deborah. You talked about compensation for farmers. Are you thinking about something like conservation easements for places where you would suggest to use these practices? So easements are certainly one possibility. It kind of depends how the operations are run. The model that we've created in the Pajaro Valley is, is what's California's first recharge net metering program. And it's patterned something like uh, PG&E's net metering program for electricity. The main difference being that with the PG&E program, it terrifies the utility because it costs them money. People are still using their network, but they're putting power on the grid instead of taking power off the grid, and it freaks out PG&E. With net metering for groundwater, it actually makes money for the agency, so it's revenue net positive, and it compensates landowners for the loss of access to their land while the projects are operating. And right now, we peg that at 50% of the cost of water while we're running the pilot program. I think. Different incentives will work in different places. Again, no one size fits all. But if there's a benefit to be derived by a community from doing projects like this, then the people who are sacrificing part of their land to do this should be made whole. They should be compensated. You don't necessarily have to pay them to farm water, but you ought to make up for the cost of allowing these projects to exist on their lands. 
two questions. One is what fraction of the water can you divert into a recharge basin? And related is, is nature actually doing this in the bottom of lakes? Because the bottom of lakes have, have full of debris from yeah, the great. around it. And they may have already been doing that in lakes. Yeah, great questions. So I grew up on the East Coast and I went to summer camp in Maine where there's a lot of lakes. Anybody else here walk into a lake in the summertime? How does it feel? Soft and squishy, right? No, nope, very little water goes in through lakes. And a lot of growers, they have little ponds on their properties, but they're retention ponds. So they're not, in many cases, that water's not soaking into the ground. It turns out in the case of the Boca Riza site, the one that I emphasized here, it's built on a paleo stream channel. It's an ancient tributary to the Pajaro River that's been abandoned. If you look at the soils next to it, they're clay rich. But right on that channel, which happens to be where that basin is, it's sandy and gravelly. So that's why if we find the sweet spots on the landscape, we can optimize this. You probably don't want to put these projects everywhere. The last thing you want to do as an agency is pay thousands of people to build projects, most of which don't work. Okay? So I think what we should do is be really clever about it and try to target the locations. So for example, there's no point building any of these in Santa Cruz. Sorry. Right? We don't have an aquifer in Santa Cruz. Now, it's good to, to hold water on your land. I've got a rain garden. We hold a little bit of water on, on our property. That's great for my plants, but it's not helping the groundwater because we don't have an aquifer in Santa Cruz. My house is on the Santa Cruz mudstone. It doesn't soak, the water doesn't soak in very well. But up in Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo Valley, Soquel Creek Water District, Central Water District, Bajaro Valley, and so forth, yeah, there are probably places in those basins where areas should be designated, maybe by easements, maybe by zoning, maybe with incentives, maybe something else, where you provide a basis for the selection of the sites and then the operation of the sites. And um, the second question you had was how much? So one of the key characteristics of this is that we're collecting the water from hill slopes before they hit uh, defined drainage. And in doing so, we're collecting small amounts of water, the tips of the flood flows, when the rivers and streams are already at flood. The amount of water we pull off the landscape is so small, you can't even measure it in the rivers and streams. So again, that's the key. These systems are not built to collect every drop of water that falls. They only operate during big events. And this is another change in the way people are looking at water resources. It used to be that if an agency thought about building a water supply project that would only run for two weeks a year, it would be considered folly. Not anymore. Not anymore. Some of the biggest events we have take place in one afternoon. In the fall of 2014, uh, which was during the drought, we had an enormous rainstorm. It was the first week in December. A bunch of us were up at the AGU meeting in the city, and it poured like crazy. Half the rain that year fell during that one storm, and the Boca Riza system got 140 acre feet in the ground in one week. Okay, so what we're looking at here is capturing the big events. It's not getting all the water. It's not drying up the streams, it's the opposite. It's taking the tips off the floods when the floods are occurring and holding it on the landscape a little longer like it used to do, right? We're restoring a tiny fraction of a system service that the landscape used to provide, but it doesn't provide now because the weather is changing and because we've paved and worked the land and we're causing more runoff. So the goal here is to restore a function that used to exist, part of it, and in doing so, get these systems back towards operating like they used to. Yeah. Is there any example of land rising because water, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if people stop yeah. depleting the, the underground water, yeah. sadly, uh, then, then it, uh, yeah. it is maybe a little reversed. Yeah, sadly, no. Uh, the only example I can think of, which is not the same thing, is I used to live in, in Texas, as Jim mentioned, when I worked for the ocean drilling program. And I was told when we rented our house that we had to water the foundation in the summertime. And you drive down the streets there in Bryan, Texas, and you'd see people like watering their houses. And it, you kind of wonder, are they trying to grow a second story or what's going on here? Like, why, why do you have to water your house? Well, the reason is because the houses are built on Montmorillonite, this clay. When it dries out in the summer, it'll crack and the foundations will sink. So you sort of inflate the clay. That's the closest I can think of to what you're describing. Unfortunately, it doesn't provide much of a water resource, but it prevents your house from collapsing. So if you live in places like that, you can water the clay and keep the clay from shrinking. But no, once the, once the, aquif once the clay units in the aquifers have, have compressed like that and they've ejected that water, 
it's essentially unrecoverable in a human lifetime. Uh, maybe over long periods of geologic time with, when the glaciers come back and you drive water in under pressure, you'll reinflate those clays, but it's, it's gone. That part of the aquifer is gone, and furthermore, sometimes you then create a seal and you prevent water from getting into the rest of the aquifer. So this loss of storage that occurs with, with subsidence, it's really problematic. And when you see this, in, 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 during the drought in the valley, uh, they were losing, um, in a couple of months, they lost a foot a month in some places. In other places, it was more like a foot or two per year of sinking. It's just a huge loss of opportunity when that occurs. Um, yes, please. Can you add wood chips to an already existing basin? Or do you have to start from the yeah, great question. Can you add wood chips to an existing basin? You betcha, and that's what we're trying to do. So one of the things we'd like to see if this really works is that we turn this into what's called a best management practice. And then when permitting is done or funding is given, not only would people be able to do it, they might be required in some cases. Now, there's a lot of complexity there, really figuring out whether we're going to do harm in some cases, figuring out what other contaminants might be affected. The costs are modest, but they're not zero. That's why you need the incentive, right? So if someone's going to get state funding, let's say, to put in a basin, we'd like to see money set aside for the incorporation of some kind of a PRB as part of the basin. From my perspective at this point, it's insurance. But I think we can also see about cleaning up that legacy of problematic groundwater. Um, Jim. Sorry. Over your 15 years of doing this, what has been the change you've seen in the landowners and the farmers? Yeah. To so Jim's asking about the changes that we've seen, you know, s since I've been working on these kinds of projects. When I arrived in 95, there was a ballot measure in South Santa Cruz County to um, prevent the water agency from building a pipeline over the Santa Cruz Mountains to get Central Valley water. They actually have an allocation of Central Valley water. And there was a community group that organized and they called themselves NOPE. It stands, <laughs> it stands for No Overpriced Pipeline Ever. <laughs> and, uh, and they won in a landslide in that ballot measure. They prevented the agency from building that pipeline. And in retrospect, it was probably good because the Central Valley has not met all of their contract obligations for years, right? Because that system is over allocated. And it turned out that the cost just exploded for the cost of the steel and the rights of way and so forth. It ended up that that project certainly would have been really, 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 really expensive. Um, in this area, uh, there was kind of, a, and, and there was a lot of ac acrimony, I'll say. The agency got sued by multiple groups, including a member of their own board of directors. And um, because people didn't like the answer that they were hearing. They thought, well, I don't like that answer. I'll take any other answer at all except that one. So let's make the agency go away, right? Let's start from scratch. Let's adjudicate. Let's, you know, do something else. It actually ended up, it was so bad, there were so many questions about what their, what their legal um, potential was for the agency to charge for water like they do that they ended up suing themselves in order to get a clear court determination. And in that case, they won and they lost. It was like, a, right? They actually got the determination and it said, yeah, you have the ability to, to charge for water. They had a Prop 218 vote, they won. And, and, and they sort of went from being a poster child of dysfunction to now being an example for the whole state. There's 127 groundwater basins around the state that are now required by law to create basin management plans. And Pajara Valley water is being held up in many cases as an example of proactive management. So there's been a huge change, I think. And part of what's happened is it's just taken time. People need to see the results. And frankly, they need people like us to become furniture at their meetings. We just have to be there. Meeting after meeting after meeting. We have to just be in the room. And we have to listen. We have to tell stories. But we also have to talk to people and understand what their concerns are. And over time, I'm not saying we did it, because in many ways, it's just a change in, in the way people are thinking more broadly. But there have been enormous changes in that area. Now, if you go into the Central Valley, I think it's a different world, right? You've seen the billboards and so forth. So, you know, this is a hard issue. There's no question about it. There's a lot of different ideas. And in many ways, our part of California, the Central Coast, is odd, right? I mean, it's a real mix of politics. It's, you know, there are people that come to the groundwater meetings in the Pajara Valley there's the California Association of Family Farmers, which is sort of about the most left-leaning group you can get. They're all about agroecology and hedgerows and, and putting habitat on their farms. And then you've got folks who have, who have 
one guy's got a bumper sticker on his truck that says, ask me about John Galt, <laughs> right? He's an Ayn Randian, okay? You've got the whole spectrum, and they're all about recharge. Everybody loves recharge because it completely cuts across the politics. It's living within your means. It's managing the landscape in a more holistic way. It's, it's spreading the benefit out across the region. It's not transferring wealth from one to the other. And so I think that's another thing we can do to try to help find solutions. In many ways, the biggest effect this could have is not going to be getting more water in the ground. It could just be getting more people to play together, getting more people to contribute so that they feel like it's, they're all part of the basin. And I think that can have a big effect because when people are in the room together a lot more often, they may be more willing to accept other solutions as well. Our goal in the Pajaro Valley is what we call a 10% solution. I'd like to reduce 10% of the overdraft, and I think we can do that with eight to 10 of these projects. That's our goal. Now, we might get more than that, but I think if we can hit this at 10%, other solutions are gonna take care of the rest. Once you have a series of these recharge basins in a network, do you see them being managed by an agency or by the individual landowners? Yeah, ultimately they're gonna have to be met, managed either by an agency or in this case, we work collaboratively with the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County. RCDs are kind of weird hybrids. They're basically local government NGO hybrids. That's another group that could operate this. An agency could also just farm it out to a consultant. Once these are running and we understand how they work, it's not too hard. The so work would be managed as a system. Yeah, and I think they should be self-sustaining in terms of cost as well. Right now, we're raising the money through grants and other activities to, to build these in the first place. That's not sustainable, yeah. right? I can afford to put my time in because nine months a year, the state of California pays me to do it. But in the long run, these should be operated on a pay-as-you-go basis, right? And I think agencies can take that on. The challenge right now is agencies are not permitted by law to do research in most cases. You know, they're allowed to charge fee for service. They cannot do research. So the university has a really important role to play in stepping up and providing the peer-reviewed research that allows them to say, this will work, let's try this. Without that information, they just can't go out on a limb. Nobody wants to be first, right? People are happy to be second or third or fourth. But the first folks to do this, well, we can take a chance at the university. Let me take two more questions. Yes. Do organic farms put less nitrate into the soil? And if so, is this partly an incentive maybe in the Central Valley for more <coughs> farms to go organic? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is it depends. You know, land use practices, organic or inorganic, still typically involve applying nit nitrogen to the landscape. And whether it's manure or whether it's um, petroleum-based fertilizers, you could still have a situation where you have an imbalance of nitrogen. And it's sort of like pharmaceuticals. You know, much of what we take in pills, we pee out. And that's just the way our bodies work. You know, the dosage we get in a pill is intended to maintain your blood chemistry despite the fact that you're throwing away 90% of the drug. I mean, that's, a, that's an approximation, right? But that's how it works. We take pills and most of it goes into our sewers. Well, Farming's kind of like that. We apply things to the landscape and the crops don't take all of it. A lot of it ends up in the ground. Now we can refine that, we can try to tune that and I think there's certainly room, but the process of, of fertilizing the landscape inevitably adds to the problem. So we need other methods to get rid of that excess. Um, and I don't think it's gonna be possible simply through management to dial that down so that we're not putting excess salts or fertilizers into the landscape. There's one more. Yes? Thinking about water politics between the campus and the town of Santa Cruz and the lack of an aquifer in the town of Santa Cruz, so we put water storage capability into the land of the campus. Are there any possible storm capture uh, projects on campus that can make a difference to the amount of water available for campus growth, for city campus yeah. relationships around water? So it's a complicated question. I'll give you my brief take, um, which is there are storage capacities on campus in the caves. The challenge is that in those systems, karst systems as they're known, the water moves so quickly that it's kind of risky. If there were a problem, if there were a spill, you'd get that into the water supply very quickly. So it's a tricky business. And I'm not sure the campus wants to be in a position of being a water purveyor. It's a lot of responsibility. Big organizations are risk adverse. It's a lot of liability. And it's interesting too that in many ways I think the city likes to be in a position of controlling our water because that then provides potentially at least a check on growth. 
right? If the campus had its own water supply, all bets are off, right? The campus unleashed, right, if we had enough water. Well, not everybody wants to see that happen. So it's complicated, right? It's complicated. There are water supplies on campus, not clear they'd be practical. Maybe for the farm. I mean, that's one idea is, you know, ultimately providing enough for the agroecology program. But again, if you really, yeah. But, you know, I think it's, comp it's, it's, it's not about the hydrology. It's about all these other issues, probably, that provides a limit. Um, I do have to take off because I'm on grad council this quarter. Let's so uh, this year. So out. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions. There's 